Hey, this is Derek. And you're listening to Skepticality, the official podcast and audio program of Skeptic Magazine for Friday, January 6th, 2000. And wait, wait for it, 2012. Welcome back to another episode of Skepticality. I'm Derek, and once again, in this new year, bringing you uh, your fill of news, interviews, and other fun information from around the world, all for the promotion of skepticism and science! Yep, it's an odd day for an episode. You know, we usually don't do this. However, this episode is also kind of a, on the short side. Today we're just going to do a quick wrap-up of a Things Skeptical which happened in 2011, and a brief look at some of the things which seem to be popping up on the radar to haunt us all in 2012. So, let's get right into it. This week is just a nice casual discussion between Tim Farley and myself, just talking about 2011, what it brought us, and what seems to be brewing in the skeptical world for 2012. In case I haven't said it again, Happy New Year, and enjoy our look back at 2011. All right. Happy New Year, Tim. Happy New Year. <laughs> so I was... Originally going to try to do this with uh, Swoopy. She had some time off over the holiday, but you know how things are at the holiday. We oh, yeah. were busy and traveling and everything. So, you know, of course, now it's after the holiday and Ari's working again. So, <laughs> so yep. it's me and you. We're going to do a short little year in skeptical stuff wrap up. Right. And uh, I we could talk about what we did as far as like skepticality but you know i think the thing that really changes is the skeptic history so i think it kind of ends up being the history of 2011 yeah i I always find it interesting to go back and and think about it because skeptics are very reactive and we tend to move from one story to another 
uh, blogging about whatever the latest pseudoscience is. And then we kind of forget that uh, what was going on six months ago or a year ago and, and uh, until, you know, maybe a couple years later and we realize, oh, uh, yeah, that was kind of important. Yeah, I was, I was, <laughs> that stuff. I was looking at some of the stuff that you sent me and it jogged my memory. I was like, wow. It's like that was like earlier this that year, last year last year. Right. I keep saying this year, right? That would be like like three days ago, but yeah, yeah. So we can uh, talk about some of the highlights, and then you have a pre-prepared normal skeptic history that's all runs down some of the really interesting tidbits. But what are the what are a couple of the major things that you came away with this past year? Um, I think obviously uh, vaccines are you know becoming the big theme that that skeptics uh, focus on. It seems to me. And and last year, the early in the year, the big story was Andrew Wakefield and uh, the BMJ, which actually is back in the news today as we're recording this because uh, uh, Andrew Wakefield has just sued the BMJ. Um, not coincidentally this week on the one-year anniversary because uh, the uh, statute of limitations in uh, Texas where he lives is one year for filing a defamation lawsuit. Uh. So lo and behold, two day, one year minus two days from when BMJ published their uh, uh, debunking of his study, uh, he filed a um, defamation lawsuit in an Austin court. Uh, against uh, the BMJ, uh, the editor of the BMJ, and uh, Brian Deere, who did all the investigation. So, obviously, he didn't want to go in the history books quietly. No, no. And uh, it seems like at least the early analysis I've read is that it's not, you know, this lawsuit doesn't have much of a chance, uh, but I guess he wants to get it on the record that he objects legally to what they said. It's interesting that he chose to sue them in Texas because obviously libel lawsuits seem to work better in England. Uh, he does live in Texas, but the people who investigated him were in England. So you would think he would have sued them in England to try to take advantage of the English uh, libel law, but uh, no, uh, apparently not. Yeah. You'd hope that England would have that cleared up by now it's been like a six or seven year process but for the skeptics you'd think that by now something would yeah. happen. they seem to be making some progress on it i hear about hearings and uh and and uh, various governmental things going on in regards to that but obviously changing laws like that that have existed for hundreds of years uh sometimes takes a little bit of time yeah so you, you have to stick with it well we know what that's about here in america because you know every time we make a big change to the law and then right at ha after it happens, it takes forever, and then it takes years for people like to stop trying to like sue the su Supreme Court for making that new law. Yep. So it doesn't change. It's government's government. Yep. So what is what is the uh, outlook for this coming year? Uh, I don't know. Well, one thing I think obviously we're going to be hearing a lot about vaccines this year. Uh, I think uh, we're, there may be some interesting developments in regards to Scientology. I'll talk about uh, some of the Scientology news from last year. But right again, right as we're recording this on New Year's Day, there was a major email that was sent out to like 12,000 members of the Church of Scientology. And what was interesting about it was the previous emails or the previous revelations from Scientology have all been from ex-members. Yeah. And, and of course, the church downplays what they're saying and says, well, this person has a grudge against us, so they're going to say whatever they want to say uh, because they're mad at us, um, which, you know, you always got to wonder what, how much of it is that and how much of it is this what Scientology is up to. But this email that came out on New Year's Day uh, is from a current good standing member who just disagrees with the way the church is being managed, doesn't, uh, you know, disagree with the, the fundamental principles of the church, but just the current management of the church. So um, there seems to be a lot of uh, pushback from the rank and file members about how Scientology is being managed, in particular, the, the money, uh, the money aspect of, you know, really pushing hard on the members to raise money for the church and not spending the money on things that you would expect a church to spend them on, like uh, 
proselytizing their message and uh, recruiting new members and things like that. It seems like Scientology spends all its money on building fancy new buildings. The other thing, of course, we're going to see this year is going to echo last year also is uh, last year we had Harold Camping and the end of the world, and this year we're going to have the Mayans and the end of the world. So we'll see how that works out. I always tell people, you know, when they say something about that, I was like, take out your wallet <laughs> and find credit cards that have expiration dates that are like in 2013. You think <laughs> that they don't guarantee that they're going to be around? <laughs> The Mayans themselves have started doing these little tours of, you know, places where you can go and see where the end is going to happen. Do you think they're doing that because they believe it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I find that funny. Yeah, it's 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 funny. I mean, it'll be just like these other things like camping and the harmonic convergence and all these major predictions that have been made over the years uh, where something was going to happen, nothing happens, people make excuses, and they move on to the next new thing. So, yes, we'll, we'll, you know, we just got to wait and see what the next new thing is. That's one of the kind of frustrating things about being a skeptic is having to be reactive to those things. At least this one, the 2012 thing, we got a lot of warning on it. Uh, so people have been talking about it for several years now. But. Oh, yes. I think I remember hearing uh, Art Bell talking about it on his radio show back when I was still in high school. Oh, sure. Yep. Yeah, it's like, yeah, in 15 years, we're going to be dead. <laughs> yep. Yeah. They need some expert Mayan guy who would talk about, well, I found some cryptic writings in some cave somewhere. It's like, yeah, okay, whatever. Right. <laughs> So very cool. So maybe we should just let you run the skeptic history. Yeah, and... I've prepared uh, you know some notes on what the kind of the major stories were of the year and uh, put it together with the dates and uh, and also some obituaries of some of the folks that we've lost and uh, we'll just kind of run it down. Great, and we'll have really extensive show notes. Yep. In the, on our website. Sure will. One great way I've found to research the history of skepticism is simply to pay attention to current skeptic events. The news stories that skeptics are talking about today are the events that we will look back on in years to come and remember as skeptic history. Since this is the first podcast of 2012, let's look back at 2011 and try to see what events we will be remembering in years to come. The year started with a bang for skeptics on the topic of vaccines when the British Medical Journal called Andrew Wakefield a fraud on January 5th. Wakefield, as you know, is the author of a deeply flawed small study in 1998 that claimed there was a link between measles, bowel disease, and autism. The study had been previously retracted and disavowed by some of its co-authors, but now BMJ said it was the result of outright fraud. The next day, Anderson Cooper called Wakefield a liar to his face on CNN. Wakefield, of course, made various excuses. But on April 5th, the British press gave Brian Deere, the investigator behind the Wakefield article, Specialist Journalist of the Year as an award for the, his years of work on the story. Other skeptical victories on the vaccine issue followed in 2011. On January 16th, the web magazine Salon, which had co-published Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s article Deadly Immunity about thimerosal back in 2005, retracted the piece because of its connection to Wakefield and even removed it from its website. On February 22nd, the U.S. Supreme Court reaffirmed the legality of the special U.S. Vaccine Injury Court after some parents tried to circumvent it so they could sue vaccine manufacturers directly. On August 8th, it was announced that rinderpest, a cattle disease, had become only the second disease to be eradicated from the planet via the work of vaccines. Many hope that polio will become the third disease to be eradicated, and all through 2011, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has stepped up their years-long effort to support this project in the few countries where polio still exists. 
But it was not all good news on the vaccine front. Vaccine-preventable illnesses have continued to surge worldwide, prompting the Centers for Disease Control to issue a serious parental advisory about measles on June 22nd. Huge numbers of measles and pertussis cases have been seen repeatedly since. Much of this is due to parental fears about vaccines sparked by the original Wakefield study. Anti-vaccine groups and those who claim vaccines cause autism continued to make trouble this year, despite Wakefield's downfall. In the U.S., the inaccurately named National Vaccine Information Center has several times succeeded in having anti-vaccine PSAs run in Times Square and on Delta flights, despite skeptic efforts to stop them. American journalist Robert McNeil was criticized in April for including the alleged vaccine autism connection in a week-long PBS NewsHour series on autism. And in Australia, Meryl Dory and the also inaccurately named Australian Vaccination Network continued to make news despite having lost their charity license last year. In the last week of 2011, the skeptic group Stop the AVN successfully lobbied to include other more scientific voices when Dory spoke at a major music festival, and they hired an airplane to fly the message vaccinations save lives over the festival. Throughout the year, there have been multiple revelations from inside the secretive Church of Scientology. The New Yorker published a major article about filmmaker Paul Haggis' experiences in the church on February 14th, and two major books on the church were published in the summer. The Village Voice and the Tampa and St. Petersburg Times, all longtime documenters of the church's excesses, have also published many articles in 2011 revealing new details about the inner workings of the church and the dissatisfaction of church members under the harsh management of David Miscavige. As I write this, a new controversy is brewing due to an email that was sent out on New Year's Day from a still loyal member of the church to 12,000 church members, criticizing Miscavige's focus on fundraising. No review of 2011 could be complete without mentioning Harold Camping and his predictions. The Christian radio broadcaster had predicted the rapture at least twice before in 1988 and 1994, but that did not dissuade him from making the mistake again. He said that the Christian rapture would occur on May 21st, followed by the end of the world on October 21st. Billboards and other ads were seen all around the United States, and indeed the world, trumpeting this prediction, and hundreds of his followers fanned out to spread the word, some giving up their homes and belongings. Of course, none of his predictions came true. Camping had a stroke on June 10th, and retired from his radio network on October 16th. When the date for Armageddon came and went uneventfully in October, he sheepishly admitted that making predictions was probably a bad idea. Psychic performers are a constant issue for skeptics. A few stood out this year. A UK performer named Sally Morgan was caught apparently using a confederate to feed her information about the audience over a radio at a September 11th show in Dublin, Ireland. A minor uproar erupted in the British press, with the familiar threats of libel action following. This prompted some British skeptics, such as Simon Singh and the Merseyside skeptics, to challenge Morgan to be tested on Halloween, but she declined to appear. In the U.S., James Randi and the JREF made an effort to challenge psychic James von Prague via an expose on ABC Primetime Nightline on August 17th. The JREF continues to directly challenge Van Prague to take their million-dollar test, but so far he hasn't come forward either. In November, another public argument erupted in the UK, this time involving a dubious cancer cure. The Observer newspaper ran an article on November 20th about a touching appeal to raise money for cancer treatment for a small child. Skeptics noticed that the treatment proposed was an unproven one, being promoted by a small clinic in Houston. That clinic is run by Stanislaw Brzezinski. When skeptical bloggers such as Andy Lewis and Reese Morgan criticized Brzezinski publicly, an alleged attorney claiming to work for the doctor wrote fairly threatening emails to them. 
This resulted in a classic Streisand effect where other skeptic bloggers came to their defense and many critical evaluations of Brzezinski's work were published all over the blogosphere. It later turned out that the threatener may not be an attorney at all, but rather a web search expert tasked with improving Brzezinski's online reputation. He seems to have had the opposite effect, and the controversy continues in the media and the blogs. Speaking of the media, a number of interesting developments in TV and media happened in 2011. Last year saw the end of both the Oprah Winfrey Show on May 25th and the Glenn Beck Show on Fox News on June 30th. However, we haven't seen the last of either of them, as both have moved on to create their own TV channels. The Oprah Winfrey Network is in basic cable, and GBTV is a subscription internet video service. On April 26, Steve Novella of Science-Based Medicine and the SGU appeared on the Dr. Oz program to talk about alternative medicine. And I already mentioned the JREF's appearance on Primetime Nightline in August. On June 28th, materials used to create the anti-evolutionary documentary Expelled were auctioned off to the highest bidder by a bankruptcy court. At least one pro-science organization bid on the materials, but in the end, the winner was the original backer of the film. In more positive media news, on October 5th, Penn & Teller finally premiered their follow-up to their popular skeptical show, Bullshit, which is called Penn & Teller Tell a Lie on Discovery Channel. In addition to that expelled bankruptcy proceeding, a number of court and legal actions this year were of great interest to skeptics. Coincidentally, many of them took place in October and November. On October 31st, an Oregon court handed out the harshest sentence yet, six years in prison, to parents who relied on faith healing instead of medical attention, causing the death of their young son. These were members of Followers of Christ Church, which figures prominently on my site, What's the Harm? New Age guru James Arthur Ray, known for The Secret and other projects, was found guilty J June 22nd in the deaths of three people in a Native American sweat lodge at one of his retreats. On November 18th, he was sentenced to two years in prison. Actually, November 18th was also the day of at least two other skeptic-related legal actions. It was the day that Peter Foster was arrested by the Australian authorities in conjunction with his promotion of the bogus census slim weight loss nasal spray. The product was also banned from a sale in Australia due to advertising breaches. It was also a big day for another bogus pro product promoter who was scolded by Australia last year, our friend Power Balance. On November 18th, they filed for bankruptcy protection in a California court. It doesn't mean they're gone, but it does mean they are hurting, which is good news for skeptics. Meanwhile, another serial huckster, American Kevin Trudeau, lost an appeal of an ongoing government case against him on November 29th. The court ruled he must pay roughly $38 million in fines. This is the same case in which Trudeau was almost jailed last year for encouraging his fans to spam the email box of a court judge. And the Supreme Court of Japan rejected on November 21st the last appeals in the Aum cult murders. These included the infamous 1995 nerve gas attacks on the Tokyo subways. This cleared the way for 13 of the cult members to be executed as a result. There was one legal action this year that involved me personally, albeit peripherally. The infamous David Mabus, well known to skeptics for years of his spamming of blog comments, discussion forums, and anywhere else that allowed posting, was arrested by the Montreal police on August 16th and appeared in court later that week. This came about because he had embarked on a protracted campaign of harassment on Twitter starting on January 19th of last year. Twitter users in Quebec, California, Georgia, and elsewhere came together to urge the police to take action in August. The entire sequence is documented on my blog in what has become by far the most read post I've ever written. On a less criminal front, a number of government agencies around the world took action against pseudoscience and other nonsense. We've already heard about the FTC's suit against Trudeau and the Australian's TGA's action against Census Slim. 
the U.S. FTC and FDA also took action against sellers of HCG, a quack diet treatment, for making unsubstantiated claims about the product. These warnings went out the very same week as Kevin Trudeau's court loss. I mention that because Trudeau was one of the major promoters of HCG in one of his books. Earlier in the year, the FDA had issued several warnings about various quack cures. Notably, one went to Internet celebrity Dr. Joe Mercola for his promotion of a thermographic diagnosis product. In addition to fake medicines, the U.S. government also twice took action against fake news in 2011. The FCC fined TV stations on March 24th for running video press releases as if they were actually news. And one of these was for the, quote, homeopathic, unquote, remedy Zycam. And on April 19th, the FTC announced they were cracking down on websites that were set up to promote Akai Berry products, but were designed to look exactly like TV news websites, even using the trademarked logos of major networks. But I think the biggest news story in skeptical regulation this year, by far, was the Advertising Standards Authority in the UK extending their role to cover websites, as well as traditional advertising, as of March 1st. Skeptics across the UK leapt into action, coordinated by the Nightingale Collaboration, and filed thousands of complaints against quack websites. This has resulted in many actions against sellers of nonsense. It's a fantastic effort that is now beginning to spread to other countries with the help of Simon Perry's Fish Barrel software, which was released in April. It was an exciting year for the skeptical community, that's for sure. In February, the first QED con was held in Manchester, UK. In October, the Center for Inquiry held SciCon in New Orleans, the first of what they hope will be annual events. Among the many events at SciCon was the announcement that a recently discovered asteroid has been named to honor longtime CSI investigator Joe Nickel. There were many other skeptical events in 2011, including the Amazing Meeting, Nexus, Skepticon, and Skeptical, and of course there were many, many smaller regional events such as Skepticamp. But there were low points as well. I don't think I need to recount the events of the so-called Elevator Gate, which began in late June and early July and caused much discussion amongst the skeptical blogosphere. In addition, CFI Canada had some management issues in the fall, leading to the resignation of several board members. And, of course, the arrest of Jose Alvarez of Carlos Psychic Hoax fame on identity theft charges on September 8th was shocking to us all. But the skeptic community has weathered storms like these before. And there is much to look forward to. Canadian businessman Lorne Trottier gave $5.5 million in November to McGill University, specifically so that Dr. Joe Schwartz can continue his public battle against quackery and pseudoscience. This was said to be the largest philanthropic gift for science education in Canadian history. Of course, with the end of the year, we must mark the passing of many personalities. Last year was overshadowed by the passing of Martin Gardner, and of course the person most talked about this year is Christopher Hitchens, who died on December 15th at the age of 62, after a battle with cancer. Many great tributes to him have been posted across the skeptic and atheist blogosphere, and more are no doubt coming. But I like to make sure that we pay some attention to the lesser-known personalities that help shape both the skeptic community as well as our cultural competitors. Interestingly, some of these people have spent a little bit of time on both sides of the fence. For instance, Hillary Evans, who died July 27th. He was a member of the Society for Psychical Research and other Fortean groups in the UK, but was also well thought of in the UK skeptic community and sometimes contributed to the UK Skeptic Magazine. And Joe Cooper, who died August 16th. He was one of the key debunkers of the Cottingley Ferry photographs, but he remained a believer in other phenomenon nonetheless. And finally, Lynn Margulis, the evolutionary biologist who died November 22nd. She was instrumental in important new aspects of evolutionary theory, but she also espoused some conspiracy theories and even HIV-AIDS denialism at times. 
Among the unabashed promoters of nonsense that left us last year were Rob Solarion, a Velikovsky researcher who promoted the idea of Planet X, who died in February. Linda Scarberry, one of the original witnesses of the Mothman cryptid, died on March 6th. And Jose Argeles, a New Age author who promoted the harmonic convergence in 1987, died March 23rd. One of the most famous, at least in his own home country, was Indian guru and so-called godman Sai Baba, who died April 24th. Theodore Rozak, who coined the term counterculture and often promoted many anti-science concepts, died July 5th. Bud Hopkins, who relentlessly promoted the idea that UFO abductions were real, died on August 21st. And Don LaPre, the so-called king of the infomercials, committed suicide in a U.S. jail while awaiting trial on October 2nd. There were many others who promoted a more skeptical or scientific view that we lost as well. They included Betty Orsini, who died March 26th. She won a Pulitzer Prize in 1980 for her investigative reporting of Scientology. William C. Beckett was another journalist who covered the earliest UFO sightings and coined the term flying saucer. He died April 24th. Barry Bloomberg was a Nobel laureate who developed the hepatitis B vaccine. He died April 5th. British actress Miriam Carlin was a supporter of atheist and humanist causes who died June 3rd. And Winstone Zulu was a courageous anti-AIDS campaigner in Africa who at first was taken in by HIV AIDS denialists but later fought them. He died on October 12th. And of course, skeptics in the blogosphere will remember Derek K. Miller, a skeptic and atheist who was going through his own battle with cancer at the same time as Hitchens, and courageously documented his illness and what it is like to face death without God on his blog. He died May 3rd. Unfortunately, there are others I don't have time to include, but look for them in the show notes and my year-end wrap-ups elsewhere. I hope we will lose very few of our important skeptical minds in 2012. Well, that's it for this 2011 year-end wrap-up. I hope I didn't miss your favorite stories of 2011. Links to additional material are in the show notes, including the locations online where I post a new skeptic history fact every day. our discussion forums at www.skepticality.com leave feedback by email at feedback at skepticality.com or by phone at area code 206-888-HOAX that's 206-888-4629 this has been Skepticality thanks for listening